I am Rev Myron. I'm a minister through Pathways of Light, and I've been a Course in Miracles student for 40 years. I'm going through the lessons this year, asking Jesus to clarify for me, and then I'm writing from that clarity, and that's what I'm sharing with you today. So let's get started. Today, we're looking at lesson 152. The power of decision is my own. Paragraph one, no one can suffer loss unless it be his own decision. No one suffers pain except his choice elects a state for him. No one can grieve nor fear nor think him sick unless these are the outcomes that he wants. And no one dies without his own consent. Nothing occurs but represents your wish and nothing is omitted that you choose. Here is your world, complete in all details. Here is its whole reality for you and it is only here salvation is. This is one of my all-time favorite lessons. I love it because this lesson places everything squarely in my hands where it can be undone. Did I ever think that I suffered because of something that was outside my mind? Or that I was sick or suffering because of something done to me and not by me? Of course I did, but no more. Everything in my awareness is there because I have made the choice to have it there. In the past, there were reasons I made that choice and then quickly forgot I had done so. Sometimes I was punishing myself for my perceived sins. I thought I was experiencing my just desserts because I deserved nothing else. Just choosing to be part of the illusion is choosing to suffer. And maybe sometimes I just wanted the experience the drama, the excitement of the story, just as I watch movies for the adrenaline rush they provide. There are still some brief glimpses into those ideas, but for the most part, I'm reviewing the show with much more detachment and with a purpose. I am here to undo, that is forgive, the beliefs that make the world what it is. This understanding that I am not a victim to anything is the foundation of this undoing process. I cannot undo something that belongs to someone else, so I must first take responsibility for what I came to forgive. No one can affect me without my consent. I give this consent because I want someone else to blame, but they are guilty of nothing and neither am I because this is all an illusion. Much has been seen, but nothing has happened. The truth is that while I'm not guilty, I am responsible. I gladly accept that responsibility these days because I see the value in doing so. I see that it is only here that salvation is. Two, you may believe that this position is extreme and too inclusive to be true. Yet, can truth have exceptions? If you have the gift of everything, can loss be real? Can pain be part of peace or of grief of joy? Can fear and sickness enter in a mind where love and perfect holiness abide? Truth must be all inclusive if it be truth at all. Accept no opposites and no exceptions, for to do so is to contradict the truth entirely. It takes faith and trust to oppose the world while we still believe in the world. But if we do this practice consistently, we begin to realize that there is no world. However, we must not make exceptions. Reality is peace, joy, and love, and oneness. It is not anger, fear, guilt, jealousy, hatred, or anything that causes the slightest disturbance. There is not separation or conflict. In other words, there is no world at all. Without the world and its bodies and stories of bodies, 
There's only truth and the truth is magnificent. We are magnificent. Three, salvation is a recognition that the truth is true and nothing else is true. This you've heard before, but you may not yet accept both parts of it. Without the first, the second has no meaning. But without the second, it's the first no longer true. Truth cannot have an opposite. This cannot be too often said and thought about. For if what is not true is true as well as what is true, then part of truth is false. And truth has lost its meaning. Nothing but the truth is true. And what is false is false. Four, this is the simplest of distinctions, yet the most obscure. But not because it is difficult, a difficult distinction to perceive. It is concealed behind a vast array of choices that do not appear to be entirely your own. And thus the truth appears to have some aspects that belie consistency, but do not seem to be but contradictions introduced by you. Salvation is a recognition that the truth is true and nothing else is true. The first part is easy enough to accept. The second part might be an easy concept, but do we really believe it? If I think that sometimes I'm sick and the sickness came from anything other than my wish for sickness, then I do not believe that nothing but the truth is true. If I believe I'm upset because my son is sick or my friend is in pain or my bank account is too low, I do not believe the second part. I must consider what I actually feel and how I react to the world. Do I still make exceptions to the truth? If I believe that the truth has exceptions, then in my mind, the truth is not true. For me to know that the truth is true, I must accept that whatever is happening to me or by me must come from a decision in my mind. Once I made up my mind that this is the only thing that made sense, I began to heal. I took responsibility for the seeming inconsistencies that belied the fact that the truth is true and nothing else. I began to forgive my beliefs. Five, as God created you, you must remain unchangeable with transitory states by definition false. And that includes all shifts and feeling, alterations in conditions of the body and the mind, in all awareness and in all response. This is the all-inclusiveness which sets the truth apart from falsehood and the false kept separate from the truth is what it is. This sounded too inclusive to be true to me when I first read it. It didn't seem true to me as I experienced my life. What I've come to realize is that the story of Myron is not my life. I am not connected to Myron at all, unless I decide there is a connection. And even then, it's not the truth. All I believe about me and my life that is not joyful and fully loving is not reality. It is a reflection of the belief that I am the character in the story and the story is me. That is not possible. I am what God created, nothing more, nothing less. Think what it means to be as God created us. We're unchangeable. Nothing we say or do or think affects our true self in any way. I've had an interesting life and in many ways, it's been difficult and painful. Myself witnessed it all fully and yet nothing about me, who I really am, changed. There is not shadow of the experience lingering on me. Once over, the experience is as if it never happened because it never happened. <laughs> Myself, as I truly exist, doesn't feel sad and then happy, sick and then well. There is no headache and then the pain is gone. There is not joy temporarily experienced to be replaced by something less. Yesterday was lovely. My mind was clear and I was happy. Last night before bed, my son called. He reported that his holiday didn't go as expected. He was sick with strange symptoms that were lingering. After the call, I was no longer happy. 
I was concerned about him. I wanted to do something to help because it seemed to be uh, seemed to be that he reached out for a reason. Though he didn't articulate that he was worried about other things, I sensed that he was. I wondered if there was something I could do to make things easier for him. In that moment, it was like I thought I was Myron rather than the witness to the ancient story of Myron. And so I suffered. This is what life is like for the sleepers. It's in stark contrast to the experience of the awakened. The ego mind wants to blame my son. He was a reason for my upset, the ego says. But it's way too late for the ego to convince me of that. He did nothing but share with me what seemed to be happening with him. I chose to see it as a call for help that I couldn't answer and so to feel helpless. It is my thoughts alone that determine my experience of any situation. I have discovered that I can love my son through his story without feeling upset by it. It's a choice I make each time. Six, is it not strange that you believe to think you made the world you see as arrogance? God made it not. Of this, you can be sure. What can he know of the ephemeral, the sinful, and the guilty, the afraid, the suffering and lonely, and the mind that lives within a body that must die? You but accuse him of insanity to think he made a world where such things seem to have reality. He is not mad, yet only madness makes a world like this. Seven, to think that God made chaos contradicts his will, invented opposites to truth, and suffers death to triumph over life. All this is arrogance. Humility would see at once these things are not of him. And can you see what God created not? To think you can is merely to believe that you can perceive what God willed not to be. And what could be more arrogant than this? For so long, I believed this nonsense. Now I wonder how I could have been so blind, so obtuse. How could this world have anything to do with God? Is God insane? Or is it more likely that the world is made up of my guilty thoughts? projected as stories that reflect those beliefs. If I continue to believe the unbelievable, then I am the one who is insane. God created me as part of himself, and to think that Myron is me is to think that God is not very good at his job. <laughs> I cannot be anything God does not will me to be. Nothing here is remotely true, but I am true, so I must not be here. Eight. Let us today be truly humble and accept that we have made and accept what we have made as what it is. The power of decision is our own. Decide but to accept your rightful place as co-creator of the universe and all you think you made will disappear. What rises to awareness then will be all that there ever was eternally as it is now. And it will take the place of self-deception made but to usurp the altar to the father and the son. Do you realize what Jesus is telling us here? Decide but to accept your rightful place as co-creator of the universe. And all you think you made will disappear. What would you be happy to see disappear? I would like to see sadness and anger and hatred disappear. I would like to see fear and guilt disappear. How about suffering and death? Would you like to see that gone? What would be left? Well, joy, everlasting peace, beauty beyond our present comprehension. Heaven would be what is left when we let go of the value we placed in what we made. It does not warrant our defense of it. And let's not forget that we are co-creators of the universe. Okay, now I'm officially blown away. Oh my dear God, I want to return home. Nine, today we practice true humility, abandoning the pre false pretense by which the ego seeks to prove it arrogant. Only the ego can be arrogant. 
but truth is humble and acknowledging its mightiness, its changelessness, and its eternal wholeness, all encompassing God's perfect gift to his beloved son. We lay aside the arrogance which says we are sinners, guilty and afraid, ashamed of what we are, and lift our hearts in true humility instead to him who was created as uh, created us immaculate, like to himself in power and in love. 10, the power of decision is our own. And we accept of him that which we are and humbly recognize the son of God. To recognize God's son implies as well that all self-concepts have been laid aside and recognized as false. Their arrogance has been perceived. And in humility, the radiance of God's son, his gentleness, his perfect sinlessness, his father's love, his right to heaven and release from hell are joyfully accepted as our own. Yes, yes, let's do this. It is not arrogance and it's not heresy to claim our place with God. It is not arrogance to accept that what happens in these stories does not affect what God has made like himself. In order to believe we are the character we came to observe, we must deny God. We must deny his parentage, parentage and we must deny our self, our true self. Shall we let go of all this nonsense and take our place alongside the creator where we belong, where we actually are? That would be true humility. 11, now do we join in glad acknowledgement that lies are false and only truth is true. We think of truth alone as we arise and spend five minutes practicing its ways, encouraging our frightened minds with this. The power of decision is my own. This day, I will accept myself as what my father's will created me to be. Then while we wait in silence, giving up all self-deceptions, as we ask humbly again, ask ourselves that we, he, sorry, let me read that again. Then we will wait in silence, giving up all self-deceptions as we humbly ask our self that he reveal himself to us. And he who never left will come again to our awareness, grateful to restore his home to God as it was meant to be. Let us do practices today that we may become willing to recognize our true self. I will not be fooled today by the imposter self. I stand today before my God and hold out my hand to him. I offer him my willingness to return to him. I thank him for creating me and for guaranteeing my creation by keeping me forever safe in his mind. 12, in patience, wait for him throughout the day and hourly invite him with the words with which the day began, concluding it was the same invitation uh, to yourself. God's voice will answer, for he speaks for you and stands for your father. He will substitute the peace of God for all your frantic thoughts, the truth of God for self-deception, and God's son for your illusions of yourself. Thank you, God. I love you, God. Thank you so much for sharing this lesson with me. And if you found it helpful, then please like it. And if you haven't yet, subscribe. And I'll be back tomorrow with another lesson.